focus on international threats. Thanks for joining us for the special Faith Nation. I'm Jenna Browder. In our Washington studio, I'm John Jessup. Well, world leaders received a bit of a wake-up call after Europe's Nord Stream gas pipelines were damaged by suspected Russian sabotage this past fall. And pipelines aren't the only critical infrastructure underwater. The global internet also runs cables along the ocean floor. Caitlin Burke explains. When you look out over the ocean, you don't often think about what's under the surface. But all over the world, there are millions of miles of fiber optic cables crisscrossing the ocean floor. They're not much larger than a garden hose, but they're responsible for transmitting up to 95% of global internet traffic. Fiber optic cables, uh, cables across the ocean are not new. We've had them since the mid 1800s, different forms, copper. But over the years, as data has become more and more important, as we've become a more digital, globalized world, more and more data uh, flows under the sea. As of 2022, there are approximately 530 active submarine cables running all over the globe. In addition to transmitting texts and emails, they also send confidential information like financial transactions and government communications. Without this tech pipeline, the internet wouldn't function, and our digitally driven societies would grind to a halt. Nadia Shadlow, a former U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor, says protecting these cables and their data needs to become more of a priority. Anytime an economy is so dependent on, on um, infrastructure or a particular sector, uh, it becomes strategic, right? Becomes, it becomes a point of vulnerability. So our adversaries and competitors recognize this. U.S. adversaries also recognize the cables themselves are incredibly vulnerable. Many people will be aware that the actual fiber optic is about the diameter of a human hair. Um, so there might be a, a couple of dozen fibers inside a cable, but most of the cable is basically to protect uh, the fiber, which is made out of glass. So it's very, very fragile. While direct sabotage could easily result in damage or destruction, Gavin Tully, an engineer and partner at a firm specializing in subsea cables, says this internet infrastructure is also at risk from fishing trawlers or even natural disasters. About 10 months ago, uh, there was a massive volcanic eruption in Tonga, and that uh, eruption created a lot of earthquakes and um, mudslides that cut all the cables to Tonga. So Tonga was basically without communication for weeks because the ash cloud also blocked the backup satellite. In October, cable damage near the Shetland Islands north of Scotland led to suspicion that an adversary might be trying to make sabotage look like an accident. That's because a Russian research vessel designed to survey the sea floor was reportedly in the area at the time. And it wouldn't be the first instance of an enemy severing a country's communications. During World War I, uh, England cut all of Germany's subsea cables, uh, which were telegraph cables at the time, of course, you know, some hundred plus years ago. Russia's war against Ukraine and this summer's Nord Stream pipeline incident served as a wake-up call for many of our allies. France proposed spending more than 3 million euros for ocean floor defense in its 2023 budget. Italy and the UK are also reportedly working to increase surveillance of their underwater cables and Taiwan is now taking protective measures to ensure communications to the island aren't knocked out by a natural disaster or conflict with China. Here in the U.S., meanwhile, experts are concerned the government isn't doing enough. We need to develop a better public-private um, approach toward understanding when these cables become under, under threat, so to share information more effectively. Um, to also probably fund more cable repair ships as well. Most cables running to and from the United States are owned by either telecom carriers or private companies. Over the past few years, it's been predominantly content providers like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Amazon investing in new lines. Shadlow says while the owners are ultimately responsible for security and repairs, the government should be involved as well, given national security interests. CBN News reached out to Google for information on how they protect their cables. A spokesperson responded that the best protection against disruption is having a variety of redundant network paths. That means they're not reliant on one single cable. So the idea is basically creating a global mesh of these types of cables so that if one gets damaged or cut, 
whether it's on purpose for sabotage or accidental or a natural disaster, it doesn't have significant effect on the global economy. Another vulnerability in our internet infrastructure comes when the data flowing through the undersea cables reaches land. It's at this point where the information is offloaded. The U.S. Office of the Director of National Intelligence classified the possibility of cyber attacks against cable landing stations as a high risk to national security. Finally, countries like China could use state-owned companies to sabotage parts of these undersea networks. Huawei Marine, for example, has built or repaired almost a quarter of the world's cables. Some experts already worry Beijing could have tasked them with spying on the data coming through. We need to be able to provide alternatives to countries and companies uh, that look to Huawei Marine for their components. Similar to the situation with 5G, right? We didn't like Huawei controlling uh, that infrastructure. While conversations are being had in Congress about securing our internet infrastructure, national security experts like Shad Lowe say no significant action has been taken. Still, the information sent through these cables grows more and more sensitive, becoming more enticing to our adversaries and more vital to protect. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Great reporting. Thanks, Caitlin. While it comes without warning and leaves no trace, the mysterious syndrome affecting certain Americans when Fake Nation returns. A mysterious illness has, become, has been attacking Americans with nausea, headaches, and ringing in the ears. It has struck dozens of spies and diplomats around the world. So who's behind the attacks? George Thomas has the details. It was the early morning hours of December 5th, 2017. Mark Polymeropoulos was in his room at the Marriott Hotel, close to the U.S. Embassy in downtown Moscow, when suddenly he started to feel very ill. And I woke up with, with uh, uh, incredible vertigo. The room was spinning. Um, uh, I, was, I had tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears. My, you know, I was nauseous. I felt like I was going to be sick. Polymeropoulos, a 26-year CIA veteran and decorated covert agent, spent most of his career hunting down Islamic terrorists in the Middle East, Europe, and Asia. He'd been shot at narrowly escaped rocket fire, and was often in the middle of many other extremely dangerous situations. But nothing, he says, compares to what he experienced that day in Moscow. And I spent a lot of time in some, some really tough places in, in our war zones. This was the most terrifying experience of my life, um, you know, basically because of, of the unknown, but, but something really, really bad happened to me that day. In the months ahead, he would come to realize that he had suffered from a mysterious microwave radiation attack. It's a weapon that is that is silent. Um, there is very little kind of signature of it, but it's designed to incapacitate, not to kill. Uh, and it's a pretty insidious type of warfare that we see being used against our, our personnel. The first reported microwave attack happening in Cuba in 2016, affecting some two dozen American and Canadian diplomats. It has since come to be known as Havana syndrome. Victims experience, among other symptoms, nausea, severe headaches, ear ringing, loss of balance, and insomnia. James Lynn, one of the leading experts on the biological impact of microwave attacks, described to CBN News what happens when a pulse blast hits a person. That microwave pulse will be able to produce a sound wave inside the head of a person. And that sound wave would start propagating inside the head and reverberates inside the head. If any tissue damage is going to happen, I believe will come from the reverberation of the sound wave that's been generated inside the brain tissue. Lin says assembling and transporting such a weapon is fairly easy. It's not going to be enormous in size. Uh, I think the size of it uh, could be a full-size car uh, trunk or in a van or uh, uh, SUV. In the five years since that initial attack in Havana, some 200 American diplomats, intelligence, and military officers across multiple continents have been hit by these mysterious symptoms. 
The Wall Street Journal reporting that in one recent attack in a European capital, a diplomat suffered a brain injury similar to those who had been exposed to shock waves from explosions. Investigators are also looking into two attacks that may have occurred on U.S. soil, one reportedly happening close to the White House. Researchers with the National Academy of Sciences said many of the neurological symptoms were consistent with the effects of directed pulsed radio frequency energy. At first, we thought it was a, a, a fluke, but now it looks like it was more premeditated. The CIA has tapped a veteran agent who helped track down Osama bin Laden to find the source of the microwave attacks. And I said in my confirmation hearing before the Senate that I would make this a very high priority to ensure that my colleagues get the care that they deserve um, and that we get to the bottom of what caused these incidents and who was responsible. The CIA hasn't publicly said who it believes is behind the attacks, but Polymeropoulos has his suspicions. Who do you hold responsible for carrying out this attack against you? You know, look, I, I think the, the conventional wisdom now, and it, it's taken some time to, to reach this conclusion, but within the intelligence community, certainly within, um, you know, the operational elements at, at CIA is that the Russians are behind this. Moscow has denied any involvement. Meanwhile, Senator Susan Collins, along with 14 other Republican and Democratic lawmakers, have introduced the Havana Act. Our bill would provide assistance to the employees of the intelligence community and other federal agencies who have suffered from traumatic brain injuries at the hands of our foreign adversaries. Polymeropoulos welcomes the financial and medical help and says what has happened to him and other American diplomats is an act of war. His illness was so bad that it forced him to quit the CIA. Uh, it's still something that, that really incapacitated me, um, and I, I feel the effects to this day. Retiring in 2019 and now writing about his experience, Polymeropoulos is the author of the new book, Clarity in Crisis, where he emphasizes, among other leadership virtues, the importance of humility, something he says he learned about firsthand these past four years. I look in the, it, it, I go down to our basement where I have all my intelligence medals, and there's, there's multiple copies of the front page of the New York Times based on operations that I ran around the world that no one will ever know about. Um, you know, that was when I was on top of the world. Uh, and now, you know, I have, a, I have a headache that never goes away and, and some, you know, some, some serious long-term effects. And so, um, you know, humility is, a, I think, a, a really good trait to have. George Thomas, CBN News. Welcome back. The longer Russia's war in Ukraine goes on, the more concerns grow of the threat of a biological attack. And the United States may be woefully unprepared. Here again is national security correspondent Caitlin Burke to the State Department, both Russia and North Korea have active biological weapons programs. Iran and China aren't far behind. Yet here in the U.S., there are serious questions to whether our main system to detect a biological attack even works. So the nation has a national biodetection system called BioWatch, and associated with that is a, um, an acquisition program called BD-21. My understanding is they don't work, period, for most of the biological agents for which those systems are supposed to be um, detecting. The Department of Homeland Security launched BioWatch back in 2003, and the technology hasn't been updated since. Dr. Asha George, executive director of the Commission on Biodefense, says it's time for DHS to shut it down. There needs to be some kind of transfer of technology or transfer of mission out of the Department of Homeland Security to somebody else if DHS can't handle it. And if it's a basic science issue, then we need to get the science and technology community, the basic research people back involved to produce something. We recently saw the issues with this detection technology play out when the first U.S. case of COVID-19 was officially confirmed on January 21st, 2020. But studies suggest the virus started circulating here up to a month earlier. We must be prepared for the next inevitable biosecurity crisis. The COVID lessons learned do not teach us the value of preparedness. I do not know what will. 
Waiting for the next crisis to take action is too late. Experts, including Dr. George, recently testified about biosecurity before the Senate Homeland Security Committee. George pointed out a lack of investment in this area puts the country at an extreme disadvantage. Russia and China are investing billions into their bioeconomy, and part of doing that is investment in uh, protective technologies, vaccines, personal protective equipment, and anything else that will, that will uh, bring the economic aspect of biology in the 21st century up to the next level. One response element in desperate need of funding is the strategic national stockpile. The stockpile is postured for a rapid, coordinated response. Originally created to ensure the nation's readiness against agents of bioterrorism like anthrax, SNS has evolved and now also contains stores of vaccines, treatments, and equipment. Yeah, so the strategic national stockpile is kind of like a pantry. And just like you're going to make some something you don't make that often, but you walk into the pantry and you say, oh, here's my sea salt and here's my baker's yeast. Um, you, you go and you pull it off, you use it when you need it. Sticking with that analogy, when we needed the baker's yeast, it had expired. Investment has been sporadic over the years due to a lack of biological threats. Things will get worse than they are right now. Then when COVID hit, supplies were diminished, expired, or the technology was out of date. Senator Bill Cassidy says the SNS needs serious reform, and he believes it can be done in a way that helps to solve the funding problem. I would like it so that it could be cycled out, not wasted, and then replaced on the back end. Because if you're selling something a year before it expires, you've got money to buy something new. Cassidy says the pandemic is now the playbook for biological warfare, which makes learning quickly from our mistakes a matter of national security. We'll never know for sure whether or not that virus started in a Wuhan lab or just spontaneously occurred. But what we do know is that now our enemies know how to do it. You had come up with the designer virus, you would simultaneously come up with a highly effective vaccine. You would give the vaccine to all your people, and then you'd release the virus. Given the COVID wake-up call, the government is moving to address various gaps, including legislation to reform the national stockpile and new investigations by both the intelligence community and the Pentagon, delving into the potential threats we face and where our biodefense currently stands. To have a threat increase without, without significant effort to try and at least prevent it from getting worse only puts us and the rest of the world in a situation where if a biological weapon were to be used, it's going to be that much more catastrophic. We can't have that. In 2015, the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense laid out 33 recommendations to prepare for a large-scale biological event. To date, only three have been fully completed. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington. Welcome back. Developing nations need energy to grow their economies. But the push for green energy in the United States and Europe is causing a roadblock. And some say it's potentially causing millions of people to remain in poverty. Dale Hurd explains. A regular event at UN climate summits is a special presentation by indigenous groups of representatives from the developing world warning that climate change is a threat to their way of life. The world leaders have to be more aggressive and rapidly uh, keep fossil fuels in the ground. That's bottom line. Talk to leaders from the developing world, however, and you hear a different concern. How being forced to use green energy will make it even harder for millions to escape poverty. Uganda's president wrote in the Wall Street Journal that Africa can't sacrifice its future prosperity for Western climate goals. Africa will have to use fossil fuels as it makes the transition. In Ghana, Peter Bismarck with the Institute for Liberty and Policy Innovation says what Africans need most is reliable energy, not what he calls diversity, his term for green energy. Africans are not basically not interested in the diversity. They are much interested in the um, efficiency and the reliability of energy before they look at diversity. 
Vijay Jawaraj of the CO2 coalition says it's the same situation in India. In a country like India, if you see there are more than 300 million people in poverty and uh, for them to come up in life, there has to be an overall economic development in the society and that can happen only when uh, there is a robust energy sector. One critic said the idea that some of the poorest people on earth can suddenly switch to hydrogen-based green technology is absurd. Remote areas of uh, within African countries are much interested in getting anything to light their refrigerators and charge their phones and watch television. Not only do wealthy nations want developing nations to switch to green energy, they're forcing the issue. The U.S., Britain and European nations have vowed to cut off public financing for new fossil fuel projects by the end of the year, including those in developing nations, even as wealthy nations continue to use fossil fuels, including African natural gas. Magat Wade is director of the African Center for Prosperity. What's the difference between you, German, who when you need fossil fuels and you realize you still need it, you're going for it, Yet you're telling me, the Africans, we can't do it. Is it because I'm black? Is it because we're idiots? Is it because we're inferior? We want to become prosperous nations. We want to become prosperous people. But for that to happen, access to reliable and affordable energy is central, is key. The, the reality in developing countries is that the situation here is far worse than what is being portrayed in the media in the West. The countries here are already struggling to keep up with the energy demand. And uh, for them to experiment with green technologies would be not so wise, uh, especially when uh, people are still living in the dark. Uh, hospitals are still uh, struggling to get an electricity connection and uh, when we live in poverty. Sudanese-British billionaire businessman Mo Ibrahim in a conference call this year with European Union leaders said that Europe's refusal to fund fossil fuels in Africa is morally indefensible. We found it, you know, a little bit strange when Europe is wallowing in gas, Russian gas, African gas, uh, putting gas projects everywhere. And uh, when it comes to Africa, no, 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 no. You are using African gas and you're denying us to use African gas. I mean, that is morally indefensible. The experts we talked to said they would welcome green energy if their nations could afford it and rely on it. But they can't. Forcing it on them now amounts to what some are calling green colonialism. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Really illuminating to see the imbalance when it comes to trying to go green. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for watching this edition of Faith Nation. Have a great evening.